What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to something a little bit different here, a military reaction. Uh, we haven't done one of these in quite a while. Uh, but I saw the other day that uh, the Operation Room was putting out this new series. And this is, I guess, the first one. And it's the Operation Iraqi Freedom. So uh, we checked out the... Um, the Desert Storm one by the Operation Room, and it was amazing. So uh, we want to check this out. Very excited about it. So let's jump on in. Six Chinook transport helicopters start their engines at Al Jaffa Air Base. <laughs> this is already the the detail is already so much better uh, than before. I mean, that just shows the improvement, but. I mean, this is going to be really good. In Jordan, 60 men of D Squadron, 22 Regiment SAS, jump to their feet and run to the waiting Chinooks, through the swelling dust kicked up by the spinning rotors. The SAS operators board their transports, and Captain Jim Watkins settles in for a long flight ahead. He can still taste the port from his troops good luck toast. The Chinooks lift off into the night sky and proceed across the Jordanian desert in three waves. Their target is a suspected chemical plant and Scud missile site in the Iraqi town of Al Qaim. The date is the 17th of March 2003. They are taking part in Operation Row. In two days, the invasion of Iraq will begin, the culmination of more than a decade of hostilities with Saddam Hussein. But first, a quick word from this week's sponsor, War Thunder, a free-to-play military vehicle online combat game. Yeah, that um, take command of a vast fleet of more than this can be a really good one. Historically accurate player still kind of um, helicopters and ships spanning over 100 years of development from the 1920s to the present. Disputed day, whether we should have win or not. Arms battles, but enjoy great 4K graphics, it's history now. sound effects with realistic physics and dynamic damage models. Instead of general hit points, vehicles suffer damage to their components that affect their fighting ability. My favourite vehicle is the Desert Storm Challenger 1 tank. With the longest tank kill in history, she's a beast. Follow my link to download and play War Thunder for free, with nothing more than a mouse and keyboard on PC, or controller on PS5 and Xbox Series X and S, or the previous console generation. For That's a limited cool. time only, new players across all platforms, as well as those that haven't played for at least 6 months, can claim a large bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and more. All right, let's get back Saddam to it. Hussein has been clinging to power after his defeat in the 1991 Gulf War, and his nation has become a global pariah. It is believed that Saddam is harbouring militant enemies of the West within his nation, and it is publicly claimed, by some, that he still maintains the ability to deploy supposed weapons of mass destruction. Today, of course, we now know how reliable these claims were. <laughs> Saddam has continued to act defiantly, despite his precarious position. But that being said, now we know, but at the time you didn't know, so they was working off the intelligence that they did have. And there's still debate whether some went across to Syria or not. Right, so, uh, I'm not really sure. What do you think? Position. Cheering recent attacks and often barring WMD inspectors from Iraq. US President George W. Bush decides that now is the moment to rid the Middle East of Saddam Hussein once and for all. He intends to finish what his father started mm -hmm. and depose the Iraqi dictator in a military campaign. The invasion itself is codenamed Cobra II, a nod to the Normandy breakout during the Second World War, but the public name is Operation Iraqi Freedom. The objective will be to overthrow Saddam Hussein and install a democracy in Iraq. We know today that the justifications made by politicians and government officials for the invasion of Iraq were, shall we say, less than sound. However, this series will focus solely on the actions of the young men and women sent to conduct the military campaign to invade Iraq in 2003. Operation Iraqi Freedom, and those Iraqis who defended against it. Good, so it's more, it's unbiased is what he's getting at. He's not going to be picking one side or the other. It's going to be um, just straight what happened, uh, the tactics behind it, uh, that kind of thing. Not, uh, he's not going to lean one way or the other, I guess you'd say. Beginning in 2002, 
the American president <coughs> sets out to build a coalition to achieve his aim. British Prime Minister Tony Blair pledges the UK's support, but unlike in 1991, global support for military action is lacking. Key partners from Desert Storm such as France, Spain, Egypt and Turkey refuse to take part, citing a lack of hard evidence of WMDs and a belief that removing Saddam Hussein will destabilise the region. The looming invasion is controversial around the world, despite an impassioned pro-war speech by US Secretary of State Colin Powell at the UN. Regardless, Bush and his cabinet have made up their mind to attack by early 2003, and another Desert Shield-style build-up begins in the Middle East. Commander of United States Central Command, General Tommy Franks, has stepped into the shoes of his Gulf War predecessor Norman Schwarzkopf, and will conduct the coming operation. <laughs> his staff promise that Big the plan will inspire shock and awe among the Iraqis, compelling them to surrender en masse like they did during Desert Storm. On the 17th of March, President Bush sends an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein, leave Iraq with your sons within 48 hours or face severe consequences. It is under this cloud of uncertainty that the SAS begins their secretive mission, which takes place 24 hours before Tony Blair will ask the House of Commons to sanction the invasion. The Chinooks continue to al Qaim, flying low across doing? the barren desert oh, of western Iraq. They are soon overtaken by American AH-6 Little Bird helicopters, who move to rocket and strafe suspected Iraqi positions nearby. The Little Birds are flying low the to avoid radar detection. The Iraqi defenders are caught by surprise and offer insignificant resistance. Enemy machine gun nests, radars and supply depots are hit hard by quick gun runs before the small and nimble helicopters escape back into the night sky. The SAS men spot the Little Birds, their mini gun barrels glowing white hot in the night sky. One operator thinks to himself, there's no turning back, Allied forces are now committed. Okay, that was the first shot. Shots, shots fired. The first wave of Chinooks arrives at the target area after a 75 mile flight from their forward refuel base near the Iraq Jordan border and land at a remote position on the outskirts of the Iraqi town of Al Qaim. The helicopters disembark the operators and Pinky Land Rovers, known as Desert Patrol Vehicles or DPVs. The plan is for decent. The fact that you can just drop a bit vehicle in the middle of a desert or wherever you want to be at and you're like mobile behind enemy lines is so dangerous. Squadron to set up an encampment and await the arrival of B Squadron, which is driving over land from Jordan in more DPVs. Together, they will assault and destroy the water treatment plant, which is also a suspected chemical weapons facility. The site was also used to launch Scud missiles against Israel during the First Gulf War, and could be again. Intelligence reports that two full regiments of the Republican Guard are in the area, promising a tough fight ahead. Watkins and his team are digging in when a pair of headlights are seen approaching their position. The men prepare to fire, but the car passes by without spotting the encampment. Hmm. Watkins and his men relax and catch up on sleep. They will spend the next day reconnoitering the plant and waiting for B Squadron to arrive. While the SAS are laying low outside of Al Qaim, the British House of Commons officially approves the invasion of Iraq. What, what was that? Just some random people, though. The men prepare to fire to set up an encampment and await the uh, arrival of B Squadron, part of that. which is driving over land from Jordan in more DPVs. Together. They will assault and destroy the water treatment plant, which is also a suspected chemical weapons facility. The site was also used to launch Scud missiles against Israel during the First Gulf War, and could be again. Intelligence reports that two full really? regiments of the Republican Guard are in the area, promising a tough fight ahead. Watkins and his team are digging in when a pair of headlights are seen approaching their position. The men prepare to fire. But the car passes by without spotting. I wonder if it's so. I didn't really say. Watkins. Was it a? I wonder. Was it a military vehicle or was it just some random person that would have been like in the middle of all this? If they would have spotted them and stopped to help or whatever, it would have been crazy. And his men relax and catch up on sleep. They will spend the next day reconnoitering the plant and waiting for B Squadron to arrive. 
While the SAS are laying low outside of Al Qaim, the British House of Commons officially approves the invasion of Iraq on the evening of the 18th of March. There's still a day before the expiration of President Bush's ultimatum for Saddam Hussein to give up power, but the coalition partners are now past diplomacy. Various special forces teams and the CIA's Special Activities Division begin their own infiltrations across the Iraqi border, awaiting the beginning of the air offensive, A-Day, when they will call in airstrikes against key military targets and attempt to rally Iraqi citizens to the coalition's cause. In the evening, B Squadron of 22 Regiment SAS links up with D Squadron on the outskirts of Al Qaim, <coughs> having driven throughout the day without being detected. At just after midnight on the, the detail on these maps was cool. Both squadrons move out to probe the defenses around the water treatment plant. They are backed up by DPVs armed with rocket launchers and a sniper team. Mobile games are going to with an ad. Clash of the SAS squadrons approach the plant's perimeter when they are spotted by an Iraqi sentry. The night sky suddenly lights up with small arms fire as the Republican Guard tries to drive the British troops away. One of the snipers quickly gets to work, seeking out targets with his Barrett 50 caliber rifle. However, a round from an Iraqi machine gun shatters the barrel and sprays the sniper with metal shrapnel. Nonetheless, the sniper coolly switches to his sidearm and continues to fire back. With such intense wow. fire coming their way, the commanding officer of B Squadron orders a withdrawal back to the encampment. One of the DPV crews find themselves pinned down and are forced to abandon their vehicle as the men sprint through a hail of gunfire to safety. The DPV is destroyed by the SAS with an anti-tank rocket before they slip away into the darkness. They have suffered only one wounded and no fatalities. Many Republican Guardsmen have been killed, but their repulse means the SAS must try to penetrate the chemical plant the following night. At 10pm wow. on the 19th I didn't realize March, that. the Commander of Combined Air Forces, Lieutenant General Buzz Mosley, receives orders to launch a short-notice airstrike within the next six hours. Mosley is informed that the CIA has located Saddam Hussein and both of his sons with 99.9% .9 certainty at wow. a compound outside of Baghdad known as Dora Farms. With Saddam showing no sign of leaving the country, President Bush is keen to decapitate Iraqi leadership right after his ultimatum expires at 4am the following morning. Mosley quickly gets to work planning the mission before awaiting final orders from the President and General Franks. When night falls, B and D squadrons of 22 Regiment SAS again attack the suspected chemical facility in Al Qaim, but once more find that enemy numbers are too great. Instead, they withdraw and are treated to the opening stage of shock and awe. Starting at 9pm, the elite 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, along with two flights of MH-60 Blackhawks armed with Hellfire missiles and 30mm cannons, move to engage Iraqi radar and observation posts along the border with Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Kuwait. The SOAR regiment, known as the Black Swarm, splits up into four groups. Each flight consists of two AH-6 Littlebirds and an MH-6 Littlebird carrying a thermal imaging system to spot targets. An MH-60 Blackhawk equipped with infrared sensors is also operating independently to support the operation. Also accompanying each flight are two A-10 Warthogs to engage any targets too heavily armoured for the Littlebirds. So is it mainly just US and Britain? Because last... Uh... During the Gulf War, it was like tons of different uh, different countries. But this looks like it's mainly just them two right now. For seven hours, the helicopters and A-10s systematically destroy Iraqi installations on the border. The Iraqis offer only limited resistance and no American aircraft are lost. They turn back to base. An SAS officer recalled, we sat in the desert watching what was a pretty impressive fireworks display. With the path clear, British and Australian special forces infiltrate into Iraq from Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Using both vehicle mounted patrols and helicopters you infiltrate into Iraq. With the path clear, British and Australian special forces Australian. infiltrate into Iraq from Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. 
Using both vehicle-mounted patrols and helicopter transport, these special operations units move to secure airfields and other valuable... I knew Australia assets. was there too, I forgot. I knew that. Meanwhile, the news that the US Air Force could take out Saddam Hussein has set off a flurry of activity at al Udayyad Air Base in Qatar. The 8th Fighter Squadron, the Black Sheep, have readied two F-117 Nighthawks piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Toomey and Major Mark Hohen to launch by 3.30am the morning of March the 20th. Mosley is discussing with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dick Myers, who asks, The President has one question. Can you get the pilots back? Mosley replies, I can get them to the target. I don't know if I can get them back. Wow. There is a pause before Myers relays Bush's final order. Strike. Eight minutes later, Toomey and Hohen are airborne and on their way to Baghdad to kill Saddam Hussein. Despite the short notice, General Mosley wants to give the F-117s as much support as possible and orders three EA-6B Prowlers from the carrier USS Constellation to jam enemy radars while two F-16CJ Fighting Falcons are diverted from a patrol to shadow the stealth aircraft and destroy any SAM sites. The strike will be followed oh. by approximately 40 Tomahawk cruise missiles from US Navy battle groups in the Persian Gulf and a submarine in the Red Sea. So during the Gulf, I guess it's because stealth was so new or something, but um, they were circling around Baghdad without anybody knowing. So I guess did they beef up the uh, the air defense or something so they can't do that anymore? I just wonder, I mean, because now it seems like they're not too confident in the stealth. And AGM-86 air-launched cruise missiles from B-52 Stratofortress strategic bombers. This mission is risky. The coalition forces have steadily worn down the Iraqi Air Force and air defense capabilities over the past year as part of a bombing campaign known as Southern Focus. However, the air defenses around Baghdad have not been targeted and many Air Force officers remember the intense SAM barrages directed at coalition aircraft above the Iraqi capital during Desert Storm. The pilots have been told they must strike the target by 5.30am or else their vulnerable aircraft will be silhouetted against the rising sun. At exactly 5.30am, mm. the two Nighthawks approach Baghdad. Mm. How much time did they have? Of overwhelming anti whilst their vulnerable aircraft will be the intense SAM barrages directed at coalition aircraft above the Iraqi capital during Desert Storm. The pilots have been told they must strike the target by 5.30 a.m. Five their vulnerable aircraft will be silhouetted against the rising sun. At exactly 5.30 a.m., the two Nighthawks approach Baghdad. Despite fears of overwhelming anti-aircraft fire, the Iraqi capital is still asleep, and the F-117s have not been They never detected. knew he was there. Toomey and Hohen locate the target area and release four 2,000-pound EGBU bunker buster bombs. These are state-of-the-art satellite-guided munitions which have been designed with missions like this in mind. The EGBUs explode in quick succession and the F-117s turn and run for the Persian Gulf. <laughs> Iraqi anti-aircraft guns fire wildly into the sky, but no hits are scored and the Nighthawks make a clean getaway. So they don't know who it is, General I just... Mosley is jubilant when told that the munitions hit precisely on target. Bitchin, dudes. Bitchin. He exclaims to his subordinates. <laughs> Bitchin. A few minutes later, the first of the Tomahawks and B-52 launched cruise missiles arrive oh, to further saturate the, the Dora Sorry. Farms area. Toomey and Hohen will make it back to al ul Dayed, and on landing are greeted by camera crews and ground personnel cheering them as heroes for taking out the Iraqi dictator. They have just won the war before it's even started. However, the celebrations of victory are short-lived. Saddam Hussein appears unharmed on Iraqi state television later that day, and it mm -hmm. is later determined that despite the 99.9% .9 certainty of his location there, the Dora Farms compound has not been used since 1995. The decapitation wow. strike has failed. That was a lot of money, a lot of munitions, a lot of coordination and risk for nothing.
risk versus reward, I guess, but man, that could have went very badly wrong. So I wonder, 99.9% .9 certainty he was there. So, whatever, so was it like a double agent that was given information, I wonder? Gave the wrong information to make sure he could get away? The mission provokes an Iraqi response. Shortly after 1pm on the 20th of March, the Iraqi military launches a seersucker cruise missile at the Marine base at Camp Commando in Kuwait. Despite the heavy presence of Patriot anti-missile batteries, the seersucker flies so low that it is not detected. Really? The missile narrowly misses the headquarters of the Marine Expeditionary Force and explodes just outside the camp fence. Two ballistic missiles are launched but Patriot successfully intercepts them. Mm. However, Saddam Hussein has sent a message that he knows the invasion is imminent. That night, SAS units outside of Al-Qaim launch one last attack on the water treatment plant, but by now, local militia have arrived to reinforce the already much larger garrison. When the SAS attack, they are greeted by another wave of small arms fire, including tripod-mounted machine guns on civilian pickup trucks. These trucks are known as technicals in military terms and prove to be a dangerous weapon. So why are they going after them with SAS, I wonder? Because they already, I mean, I know you want special forces for this kind of thing, but, but because they don't want to destroy anything, I guess. Oh, they think there's chemical weapons there, too. So if they bomb it, they could release chemical weapons, and maybe that's why. They want to take it with small arms fire, I bet. Because, I mean, there's not using air support or anything, that's what I was like. But even with air support, they could at least take out these guys. So, maybe, I don't know, let me just see how, how it works out. I know we don't lose, so <laughs> they'll, they'll figure it out. Although they are the most elite unit in the British Army, the SAS find themselves outgunned. They did again. B they had to retreat again. Are once again pushed back, but this time they are in danger of being overrun as they retreat. The Iraqi militia and the Republican Guard heavily outnumber the SAS and go on the offensive. They fight a pitched battle against the Special Forces operators outside of a Bedouin village on the outskirts of Al Qaim. The rocket launchers aboard the DPVs prove vital in driving off the attackers and inflict casualties on the enemy as they attempt to overrun them. After hours of fighting, the Iraqis withdraw, but the SAS commander is informed that a convoy of 20 Iraqi military vehicles are looking for his unit. That looks fun. That looks cheesy, but kind of fun, actually. What is it? Is it a mobile game? I don't know. Knowing that storming the <laughs> complex would result in unacceptable casualties, the commander instead orders an airstrike to destroy the facility. As dawn breaks on the 21st of March, two and a half thousand pounds of munitions are dropped on the area while the SAS retreats Here we into go. the desert. Two operators Here we go. So let's, not, let's go back so we don't have the interruption of the, the complex would result in unacceptable commercial. casualties. The commander instead orders an airstrike to destroy there we the facility. Go. Or the airstrike. As dawn breaks on the 21st of March, two and a half thousand pounds of munitions are dropped on the area while the SAS um. retreats into the desert. Two operators will receive the military cross for their actions outside of Al Qaim. The events of this day force a major change to the overall plan. For is this the is this is this a river? Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Okay. At first, I thought it was a line, but this is one of the one of the um, I can't remember what those rivers are major rivers. I think they're in the Bible, right? Okay. So this is more kind of greenish area in here. This is the desert, I guess, and this is more greenish area of Baghdad for Iraqi freedom. The date for the invasion, G-Day, had been set for the morning of the 22nd of March in concert with the start of the air war. However, 
General Franks and leader of the ground offensive, Lieutenant General David McKeonan, fear that the now alert Iraqi government will conduct a scorched earth policy and destroy their country's infrastructure to halt the invasion. Maintaining Iraq's infrastructure is a key priority for the coalition leaders. As such, the decision is made to move the land invasion up to the night of the 20th of March. Unlike Desert Storm, the ground attack will now begin before the massive air offensive. The bulk of the forces involved in Iraqi freedom will attack into Iraq from Kuwait. The governments of Turkey and Saudi Arabia are sympathetic to the coalition cause, but both have refused to allow ground troops to use their countries as staging areas. Understandable. With most coalition forces in the south, a rapid advance to Baghdad is required to topple the regime as quickly as possible. On the left flank, Lieutenant General Scott Wallace's 5th Corps represents the main axis of advance, and will push through the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and destroy any Iraqi units they encounter. The key armoured capability of 5th Corps is the 3rd Infantry Division, fielding M1A2 Abrams tanks, M2 Bradley fighting vehicles, and M109 Paladin self-propelled howitzers. Look at that. It, it doesn't look like if you just look, it's like, okay, we got some tanks. Got some tanks, all that kind of stuff. But look at all these whole brigades of people. I guess, I don't know what the name, the, the, the actual names is, brigade or company or what, but there's a lot, a lot of stuff. It ain't just a couple. Supporting them as ground infantry, also 82nd, 82nd, 101st, 101st Airborne Divisions. Altogether, 5th Corps will fill 247 Abrams, 264 Bradleys, and 132 artillery pieces. The 101st will provide the bulk of the helicopters with 151 Apaches, 52 Kiowas, 62 Chinooks, and 178 Blackhawks supporting Wallace's divisions. On the right flank, one Marine Expeditionary Force will again go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Saddam's forces after taking part in Desert Storm. The MEF is comprised of the 1st Marine Division and 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade. A total of 50,000 men and 10,000 vehicles will move to capture Iraq's southern oil fields and the port of Umm Qasar before also turning north to attack Baghdad. The 1st Marine Division is commanded by Major General Jim Mattis and is equipped with 120 Abrams tanks. The UK 1st Armoured Division will move to cut off and capture Basra, the most important city in southern Iraq, with 166 Challenger II tanks, 236 Warrior Infantry fighting vehicles, 66 Scimitar light tanks, and 36 AS-90 self-propelled artillery pieces. In addition to those already infiltrating into Iraq to conduct recon patrols, combined special forces from the coalition nations will launch amphibious assaults against the Al-4 Peninsula and offshore oil rigs to seize crucial oil installations in the south. 250 Navy SEALs from the United States, a brigade of Royal Marines from the UK, and 126 Polish Grom Commandos are tasked with securing Iraqi oil infrastructure. In the north, Special forces have been steadily trickling into so it was a pretty good coalition for over a year to organize an offensive against Saddam's regime. Rather than a northern front established from Turkey, the Kurdish Peshmerga will handle the bulk of the fighting to tie down Iraqi units. The United States is providing 706 combat aircraft, while the British contribute 68, and the Australians a squadron of 14 FA-18 Super Hornets. Altogether, 309,000 coalition troops will invade, supported by just over 1,200 aircraft, including 790 fighters and bombers. It is less than half the total of the combined forces which took part in Desert Storm, but US Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has purposefully kept the number of troops low. To him, this campaign will be carried by American technological superiority and aggressive commanders on the ground, who were told to avoid large population centres. Under Rumsfeld's doctrine, there should be no need for a larger invasion force. Facing the coalition is the Iraqi military, which on paper is still a serious threat. 300 to 350,000 ground troops are organised into 16 divisions in five corps. However, two-thirds of the Iraqi army is composed of untested conscripts, 
while the rest of the ground forces are equipped with outdated Soviet-era weaponry. Sounds like Russia. The 70,000-strong Republican Guard once again represents the backbone of Saddam's military. They are organised into six divisions and have much better equipment than the regular army. Altogether, the Iraqi military has around 2,000 tanks, 3,700 APCs, and 2,300 artillery pieces. Yet most of this strength exists only on paper, as the Iraqi military as a whole is in a far worse shape than it was before Operation Desert Storm. The coalition far outnumbers the Iraqi Air Force, which is believed to have 300 mostly obsolete combat aircraft. At 9pm on the 20th of March 2003, the ground offensive starts with a short- It wasn't that long since Desert Storm, honestly. I mean, what, three, I mean, ten years, it's one decade, basically. And, I mean, they was demolished in Desert Storm, so they've been building up, but, I mean, it takes a while to build your military back up, so no way they could be back to what they even was during Desert Storm, you know? So, uh, they gotta be uh, really, really suffering to to build their military up in 10 years. And I'm sure they had sanctions against them and everything else, too. Short but sharp artillery barrage from 155mm guns of the 15th Regiment of the US 3rd Infantry Division. After 20 minutes, 1st and 3rd Battalions moved to clear Iraqi border guards from the massive sand berms which mark the boundary between Kuwait and Iraq. 3rd Battalion encounters machine gun fire coming from two observation posts, but both positions are quickly neutralised by Bradleys and Abrams. Armoured tractors then move in to bulldoze holes through the berms so the mechanised units can cross the border. It is not long before the channels are cleared and the invasion force moves into the openings. Now at the tip of the spear of the 1st Marine that? Division Just like the walls? 374 men and the invasion 3rd Battalion encounters machine gun fire coming from two observation posts. How do the they just go over it? quickly neutralised by Bradleys and Abrams. Armoured tractors then move in to bulldoze holes through the berms so the mechanised units can cross the border. It is not long before the channels are cleared and the invasion force moves into the openings. Now at the tip of the spear of the 1st Marine Division are the... So it was just... They just couldn't make it through because it was... Huh? How did they go through then? 374 men of the 1st Reconnaissance Battalion I'm confused on that one. into Iraq in a convoy of 70 Humvees. 1st Recon is ordered into the breach early on the 21st of March, with Sergeant Brad Colbert in the lead Humvee. Day is breaking as Colbert notices that his rear gunner, Corporal James Trombley, has fallen asleep as they cross the Iraqi border. Colbert taps Trombley on the shoulder to rouse him from his sleep. Wake up Trombley, you're missing the invasion. <laughs> <laughs> the convoy continues into Iraq. Oh, I love it. Yeah, there's some humor in the head. Hang on, hang on. Oh, no, 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 no. Go back. Colbert taps Trombley on the sh rolling into Iraq Go in back. a convoy of 70. Oh, I love feet. it. First recon is ordered into the breach early on the 21st of March, with Sergeant Brad Colbert in the lead Humvee. Day is breaking as Colbert notices that his rear gunner, Corporal James Trombley, has fallen asleep as they cross the Iraqi border. Colbert taps Trombley on the shoulder to rouse him from his sleep. Wake up, Trombley. You're missing the invasion. The convoy continues into Iraq, with marine cobras flying overhead. Follow the links to download the game, wow. where for a limited time only, new players across all platforms, as well as those that haven't played for at least six months, can Is claim a it? large bonus pack, I'll including let him get multiple his... premium vehicles, premium account, get his, and exclusive uh, 3D decorated in vehicles, here, because man... Thanks again to our patrons who helped to make these videos possible. Your support is the reason. Pause it there too to give him a little bit of uh, recognition. Hey, this I love this guy's stuff, man. Uh, the operation room. This is a really, really cool, cool uh, channel for anybody who likes this kind of stuff. Uh, I've seen a lot of them that are like similar, but they. Um, but there's a little bit of bias in there and, um, some of them are just, um, what if scenarios, but this like st sticks to the facts and the animations perfect. And 
uh, the detail is really, really good. So go and uh, like and take a check check his video out. Like his uh, subscribe to his channel. Um, it's really good. So can't wait to see uh, some more of it. All right, if you like that, then uh, let me get my light myself. If you like that, then uh, let me know, and we'll do some more. Thanks for watching.